I will talk today about female sexual function and dysfunction. And I work at the Department of Sexology and Psychosomatic Gynecology, and we actually have a small team. Uh, we work with four psychologists, sexologists, psychologists, and also with two medical doctors, one gynecologist and one uh, general medical doctor. And we do patient care, so we see patients, uh, men and women, with sexual problems, sexual dysfunctions, and we also do research, uh, and that is more basic research, experimental research, but also more clinical and uh, patient-centered research. So when we look at the patients we see yearly, uh, we see about 300 new patients a year, and um, uh, 75 uh, of... Uh, well, three quarter of the patients is female. So most of the patients that come to our department are, are female patients. And they come with uh, different complaints, uh, such as uh, I have a lack of sexual desire, or it's not possible for me to become sexually aroused. I cannot reach orgasm, or it takes a lot of time to reach orgasm or the problem of sex is painful, penetration is painful, uh, and there are also women who report that they are not able to have sexual intercourse, uh, and they report that it seems to be too tight or too small, uh, and that it's not possible to have vaginal penetration. So these are the main sexual problems uh, women seek help for at our department. It is good, I think, to know that there's a lot of comorbidity of sexual problems in women. So when a woman is reporting a lack of desire, she often also reports problems in having uh, arousal and also often orgasmic problems. Uh, or when a woman has dyspareunia, the problem of pain during intercourse, uh, these women also often report arousal problems and desire problems. So there is comorbidity of sexual complaints and sexual problems. Uh, it al it's also good to, to know that to diagnose a sexual disorder, such as a disorder described in the DSM-5, then a sexual problem should cause significant distress. So a person has to be really bothered by it. And it must also occur in, uh, well, most of the occasions of sexual um, activity. And the problems have to have a minimum duration of six months. So you have to have the problem for a longer period with significant distress to have a sexual disorder. And it shouldn't also be not attri uh, attributable to another disorder, for example, depression, or to severe relationship distress or problems, or for example, to the effect of somatic diseases. Then you can have a sexual problem, but then it's caused by somatic disease. So then it's not described as the sole uh, sexual dysfunction. Something about the prevalence, how often do we see sexual problems? Here you see numbers from uh, a Dutch huge population study that is done each five years or six years. Uh, and it's done in, in a large representative uh, Dutch population. Uh, and what you can see uh, regarding the questions about sexual health and also the experience of sexual problems, that, um, well, with, when you look at a report of at least one sexual problem, you can see in different age groups of women that in the younger age group, uh, women has showed the highest percentage of reporting at least one sexual problem, 21% in the younger age group. And in men, you can see that uh, mostly in older men, there are sexual problems. And in older men, these problems are often erectile problems. And in these young women, it's often a sexual pain problem, but also arousal, arousal problems. 
when you look at uh, in this um, research, it's also asked to what extent people experience distress and how often they experience these sexual problems. And when you look at the percentage of women that report um, often the experience of sexual problems with significant distress, you can see the percentages are lower. Uh, but still, there are 7% uh, reporting uh, a lack of desire, 4% arousal problems, 6% lubrication problems, not becoming wet during sexual activity, 4% uh, orgasmic problems, and 5% pain problems. So these are percentages of women who do really experience distress from these uh, sexual um, complaints. So in this lecture, I want to talk about, well, how can we understand these sexual problems and also think of what may be good ways to help people with those problems. So I will talk about how does sex work and I will discuss motivation and emotion models that can help us understand sex. I will also discuss and illustrate these models with some psychophysiological studies uh, we did. I will discuss factors that seem to be important in female sexual dysfunction and I will end with a discussion of clinical implications and also talk a bit about the treatment of desire and arousal problems but also pain problems in women. So I have a lot to talk about. Uh, so how does sex work? To start with, well, you may all be familiar with this older model. Uh, it's made by Master and Johnson, actually the first uh, researchers, you may say, in the field of uh, sexual uh, psychophysiology. Uh, and they describe the sexual response in this sexual response cycle model. And what they described are different phases, a desire phase, that should be independent of a sexual arousal phase. And when arousal is strong enough, sexual arousal, which is shown in increases in genital blood flow, resulting in men in an erection and in women in lubrication of the vagina, and also in feelings of sexual excitement, when this arousal is strong enough, it can result in orgasm, which is shown or goes together with ejaculation in men and also contraction of the pelvic floor muscles also in women and also gives a in feeling of intense pleasure. And after that, you have the resolution phase um, during which all, everything comes to rest again. So this was actually one of the first response models that were, uh, was made by, by Masters and Johnson. Another model, and that's a more recent model, is the incentive motivation model. And that is actually developed by Frederick Toads, a motivation researcher from, from England. Uh, he's still working, although he's old, he's still working and active. Uh, and in this model, um, this model states that to develop sexual motivation, sexual interest, there should be a stimulus. And that stimulus should be combined, combined with a sensitive physical state. And a, a sensitive sexual physical state is influenced by hormone levels, but also by neurotransmitters. So when there is a sensitive physical state, uh, and there's also a stimulus with a sexual meaning, and that stimulus is processed. Then the combination of these can result in genital responses and also in sexual feelings and also in actual sexual, sexual behavior. But in this model, it's also stated that the meaning of the stimulus is very important and the meaning of a stimulus is stored in your memory. So we all have a memory for past experiences and we can have more positive and more negative experience also in the area of sexuality. And when a stimulus is matching with a positive sexual meaning, then it can result in 
sexual arousal and in positive sexual feelings, while when a stimulus has a negative meaning, it will result in other emotions. So when you take, for example, a stimulus like a specific smell, a specific smell can have a very positive sexual meaning for you when it was, is, for example, the smell of the perfume uh, that a, a partner, a previous partner with which you had very nice sexual experiences, when that smell is matching with that perfume. But when the smell is matching with a perfume that was used by a perpetrator, then that smell will have a very different meaning. So your learning experiences and the, the information that is stored in your memory is really important also in this model. Also in this model, there is a place for regulation of responses and inhibition. So it's not the case that when there's a sensitive stimulus or a sensitive state and a sexual stimulus, and there's a match that there will be responses and behavior, there will be activation of motivation and action tendencies, but these responses can also be regulated and inhibited. So this model, this incentive motivation model is quite similar to emotion models. So we, from our research, we see sex as an emotion. And emotions have evolved um, uh, during evolution to help us to adapt to the environments. So for example, when you see a stimulus like a steak, that can be dangerous, there are automatic emotional reactions, physiological responses. For example, your heartbeat will increase, there will be a sweating response, and there will also be a preparation of behavior. For example, a tendency to, to flight or to fight. Um, so, and when you become aware of this preparation and those physiological responses, when you become aware of these responses, then you experience emotional feelings. So that's the experiential part of the emotional response. So this is a quite well-known uh, model of emotion that also states by, for example, uh, Joseph Ledoux and Antonio Damasio, that these emotional responses are elicited in a, in a very automatic way, in a reflexive way. So these responses are very, very, very fast. So if you see something in your garden and it looks like a snake, these responses are automatically elicited. And when you actually see that it's not a snake, but the garden hose, then these responses are inhibited. So this is a very fast response to respond in a good way to, to your to danger in the environment. And we think that for sex, it works the same. So when there's a sexual stimulus, there will also be automatic physiological responses, specific genital responses. There will be also action preparation, preparation of sexual action. And when you become aware of these emotional responses, then you experience sexual feelings, feelings such as desire or feelings such as sexual arousal or feelings of lust and pleasure. So we can also study these responses in what we call our sex lab. And I will ask, uh, tell you something about how we study sex in a lab setting. Uh, in such a lab setting, we assess genital responses, but we also, we are not only interested in, in what happens in the genitals, but also in the feelings, in the experiential part of the, in the emotional response. So also what people experience regarding uh, sexual feelings. So in women, we can assess genital responses by this um, vaginal probe. This is a small probe. It has the, the size of a normal menstrual tampon and women can bring in it themselves. 
uh, and there's a small plate attached to the probe, which takes care that it's brought in the same position for each uh, woman. And in this probe, there is a small uh, light and also a light sensor. And the light brings light into the vagina and the vaginal walls reflect that light. And the photocell is picking up that reflected light. And when there's an increase in blood flow in the vaginal walls, there's more light backscattered. So we can use this probe to assess changes in um, blood flow in the vaginal wall. And changes in blood flow in the vaginal wall is a very specific sexual, physical sexual response in women. And here you can see the signal of this rec of the recording of what we call vaginal blood uh, uh, pulse, vaginal pulse amplitude, because what you can see, you can see pulse in the signal. That's because you can see the heartbeat. So you can see changes in blood flow with each heartbeat. And here you can see an, an, a recording in a normal resting state and during um, exposure to erotic films. So during a sexual aroused state, and you can see a clear increase in vaginal blood flow. Uh, as I said, we are not only interested in what happens in the genitals, but also in what people experience. So we also ask them to report about their sexual feelings. So for example, their level of sexual arousal, feelings of lust, feelings of pleasure, but also negative feelings such as shame or uh, disgust. And we ask them to, to rate these feelings on, on a scale. For example, I do not experience them at all to very, very strongly. So this is the subjective sexual arousal part. Something about the setting and also the stimuli uh, we use in this kind of research because this is of course very specific kind of research. Um, and in, in such a lab setting, we use erotic pictures to elicit sexual arousal responses, but also erotic movies. Uh, and we can also give people a tactile stimulation in the form of vibration to the genitals. And well, I will also tell you that during these assessments, um, participants in this kind of studies are completely private in a room. Um, the experimenter is in a room next to it. So they can complete the experimental procedure completely privately. And it's also good to know that they are dressed. Some people think that people are naked during this kind of research, but they are not. They uh, can um, uh, bring in the, the vaginal device and after that they can dress again, um, and uh, so they are dressed during these ass assessments. And of course, we inform participants very well before what happens, uh, because, uh, well, it is important for people to know exactly what happens to decide whether they want to participate in this kind of research. And of course, they, they sign informed consent. And a lot of people think, well, is it difficult to find participants for research on sexual responses? And I can tell you that actually it's not very difficult because uh, people are very curious also about this kind of research and are, are also interested in, in participation in research in sexology. So here you see again the vaginal pulse amplitude, the genital response in women. And what you can see actually is that when an erotic stimulus is starting, here erotic movie, that it, this increase in genital blood flow is happening very, very fast. So it has the characteristics of a, a very reflexive, uh, automatic, uh, physical response to sexual stimulation. So this is, a, well, this shows this kind of unconscious automatic elicitation of sexual emotions. And I think it's, it's also interesting to tell you a bit more about this automatic activation. 
And because I want to tell you a bit more about this, I will also discuss a study we did in men. And in this study, we actually wanted to know whether sexual stimuli can automatically activate emotion motivation systems in the brain. And we also wanted to know whether dopamine, an important neurotransmitter in reward, is modulating this activation. So what we did in this study is we had a healthy young men and we gave them um, medication that was increasing dopamine levels. We gave them lipodopa, or in another group, they received haloperidol, which is blocking dopamine activity. And in a third group, um, these men received a placebo. And of course, this was a double blind study. And while this medication was uh, active, they, uh, went into the scanner to assess their uh, brain activity. And they, we give, gave them their uh, so-called backward masking task. And in a backward masking task, you give people target pictures, target stimuli, and we show them sexual stimuli and also neutral stimuli. Mm -hmm. And these target pictures are shown very, very briefly, only 26 uh, milliseconds. And then they are immediately followed by a neutral picture with a longer duration. And because of this way of showing, people do not see consciously these target pictures. So these sexual and neutral pictures, they only see the neutral uh, masking pictures. So this is a way to expose people uh, on a, you may say, unconscious level with emotional stimuli. And we wanted to know whether exposure in an unconscious way to sexual stimuli would activate emotion motivation systems in the brain. And what we actually found is that in during exposure to these sexual stimuli, there was stronger uh, activity in the nucleus incumbens, which is a very important area for reward and also in the anterior cingulate cortex, which is also an important motivation um, area, which is also involved in the decision of to go or not to go. So these are two systems important for emotion and motivation. And we saw that these systems are more active when you expose people to, to, to sexual stimuli in when they are even not aware of processing these stimuli. And what we also observed was that in the levodopa condition, this activity was stronger compared to the placebo condition. And in the haloperidol condition, this activation of these systems was, was lower. So what this study shows actually is that the brain is, is highly sensitive for sexual stimuli and that sexual stimuli activate automatically emotion motivation system and that neurotransmitters, in this case, dopamine is important here and that dopamine facilitates um, while when you block dopamine, then these responses are, are decreased. So this is showing that this motivation or sexual motivation is elicited in a very well early phase when you are not aware of processing sexual stimuli. So when there's a sexual sensitive sexual system and you process as what you can call a sexual competent stimulus, then the result is arousal in the brain in these systems and when you are aware of these uh, responses, feelings of arousal, of desire and arousal, and also sexual action. And we know that the sensitivity of this sexual system is influenced by, for example, as I described, neurotransmitters. So for example, specific medication that lowers, for example, dopamine activity, such as antipsychotics, can decrease sexual motivation because it influences the sensitivity of the sexual system. But also hormone levels 
or neurological disorders or endocrine disorder can affect the sensitivity. For example, when in women there is damage to the ovaries, for example, due to cancer treatment, um, this can result in very low testosterone levels and this can affect, decrease the sensitivity of the sexual system. So it's important to think about the sensitivity of the sexual system. Um, but it's also important to note that only a sensitive system is not in enough. There should also be a stimulus to activate that system to elicit motivation. So this incentive motivation model that actually showed that desire and arousal are both elicited by processing of a sexual stimulus so that it's not the case that desire is something that comes from within and can be there without emotional arousal that knowledge resulted also in changes of the description of sexual um, problems in women in dsm-5 so before there was um, a distinct sexual desire problem and a distinct sexual arousal problem. And now the idea is that desire and arousal are highly connected, um, maybe two sides of the same coin. Uh, and that also resulted in merging of these disorders in the DSM for, for the description of female sexual uh, disorders. So a question is, uh, when it comes to women with problems of uh, low desire and arousal, are these women less sexual arousable? Is their sexual system maybe less sensitive? And in this um, context, it's interesting to look at a study that was done by Evan Mann, uh, also yeah, a quite famous Dutch sexologist who very sadly, I worked a lot with her together um, on several studies. She actually died a year ago as a consequence of, of breast cancer, which is really, really a great loss for, for the sexology field. And she also was a very kind and nice person. Um, but she did a study, uh, actually one of the first in women with sexual arousal uh, and interest uh, disorder. And she assessed their genital um, responses to erotic film and also their levels of uh, subjective arousal and also their uh, affective uh, responses. And what she observed here, you see the responses of the patients with a sexual interest and arousal disorder compared to healthy controls. And these were somatically healthy women, so no somatic diseases. But what you can see that in the women with a sexual interest and arousal disorder, the genital responses to an erotic film was actually similar to the control group. So these women, and this is also observed in other studies in this group, that these women do not show uh, a lower um, genital arousability uh, in response to sexual stimulation. However, when you look at the subjective responses, the report of feelings of sexual arousal, or feelings of sensuality, or the report of positive effects, then you can see that there's a difference between patients and controls. So women with interest and arousal problems report lower feelings of sexual arousal, lower feelings of sensuality, and less positive effects. So this points to uh, not a problem in the sensitivity of the system for sexual stimuli in these women, but it points to the fact that maybe the stimulus has a more mixed or ambivalent meaning for these women. So it's not the, sex the sensitivity of the sexual system or 
a, a physical problem that causes these complaints of low sexual interest and arousal, it may be more the stimulus meaning. So then a question can be what is important in women also at the stimulus part. And then I think it is important to, to discuss and to, to, well, to discuss with you that when you look, for example, at population studies, and these are numbers from this large Dutch population study, but this is also shown in other international studies, that when you ask women and men how much sexual pleasure they experience in general during a partner sex, then you see that the percentage of women that report uh, that they experience substantial levels of sexual pleasure, these percentages are, are lower in the female population. So women seem to have less rewarding sexual experiences. And then it's also important to know, and I think you may be familiar with the, the word orgasm gap. There seems to be a gap in heterosexual men and women in how often they experience uh, orgasm during partner sex. So here you see numbers from a very large um, uh, study uh, in the United States. And there they asked uh, men and women how often they experience orgasm during partner sex. And the light blue color is um, the part that, re that experiences orgasm usually or always. And what you can see that in um, heterosexual men, almost all men report that they experience orgasm usually or always, while in heterosexual women, it's uh, 65%, so that's substantially lower. So what you can see that in heterosexual relationship, um, women um, experience orgasm quite a lot less often than their uh, male partners. So you base think or conclude that um, at least in heterosexual relationships, uh, sex is less rewarding for women because orgasm is a really rewarding experience compared to men. You can also see that in lesbian couples, the percentage um, of orgasm in women is, is higher. So that shows that maybe in lesbian couples, um, uh, women uh, know better how to give each other an orgasm. So then sex may be more rewarding. Another important thing I think uh, is when it comes to stimulus meaning for women is that women in general experience more often sexual abuse and also pain problems. So when you look at the numbers of unwanted sex experiences, and these are also numbers from the Dutch population, but you can see this high percentages of experiences with unwanted sex in the female population. You can see this in, in, in all international studies too. That quite a number of women report unwanted sex. You can see here 53% uh, reports unwanted, experience of unwanted kissing and touching. But also 22% of the women reports that they have experience of sexual violence and sexual violence is um, unwanted um, manual, oral, vaginal, or anal uh, sex. So quite some women have unwanted negative sexual experiences in their history. Of course, also men, but here the percentages are, are, are lower. So what this shows is that for women, sex 
can have a more ambivalent meaning. It can also have a meaning of, well, a negative meaning of, of danger or, or pain. And then we know from more recent psychophysiological, uh, uh, psychophysiological studies I did, in which we studied aversive learning, that aversive learning, negative experiences can influence your sexual response. So what we found in the lab that when there's an association between sexual stimuli and a negative stimulus, for example, a stimulus that gives pain or gives you the experience of strong disgust, when you repeatedly pair a sexual stimulus with such a negative stimulus, this results in a lower sexual arousal response. And we also see in these, you can say classical conditioning studies that the sexual response is restoring when the negative stimulus stops. But we also see in these studies that negative feelings in response to that sexual stimulus that was paired with pain or with disgust, that negative feelings and also the tendency to avoid the stimulus is more persistent and it takes more time to extinct. So this shows that negative experiences can affect stimulus meaning and makes a stimulus, a sexual stimulus change into a more aversive stimulus. And that extinction is possible of this learned aversive reaction, but that it's not always easy. So actually we try to study what helps in extinction or maybe in counter conditioning. Another interesting thing is that we also see in psychophysiological studies um, in which we can also assess pelvic floor activity, that we see that pelvic floor activity is increasing in situations in which women experience fear, but also disgust. So with a vaginal probe that does not only assess the vaginal pulse amplitude, so genital uh, blood flow, but also the activity in the muscles that are surrounding the vaginal entrance, the pelvic floor muscles, that there's more activity in these muscles during fear and disgust. So that shows that in a fearful situation, when there's uh, the emotion of fear or disgust, there's higher activity in these muscles, which makes the entrance of the vagina more tight and penetration um, less easy. So, and this shows that uh, during a fear response there, you may say there is an automatic um, defense uh, system maybe that gives um, also more activity in the pelvic floor, um, but also for example, more activity in, in, in in other um, areas uh, or, or muscles in, in your body. But that also shows that fear uh, is making it more uh, difficult to experience penetration without, without pain. And this is important um, in the context of sexual pain problems in women. Because um, a highly useful explanatory model for sexual pain problems in women is that this has a lot to do with fear and also the effect of fear on the pelvic floor, but also on sexual arousal. So according to this explanatory model, when there is the experience of pain in women, so there's a painful penetration experience, this can result in catastrophizing thoughts. The next time you may think, oh, it will be painful penetration. And that will result in pain-related fear. And when there is 
fear, there will be increased muscle tension and also increased pelvic floor muscle tension. But fear does also uh, decrease sexual arousal. We can also see this in psychophysiological studies. And when there's decreased arousal and decreased vaginal blood flow, there's also decreased lubrication of the vagina. And when there's decreased lubrication, but also increased pelvic floor muscle activity, which makes the entrance of the vagina tighter, when you try to bring something in to have intercourse, then there will be more uh, friction between the, the vulvar skin and the penis. And this can result in irritation of the vulvar skin and can result in pain again. So then you have a vicious circle that can make the pain problem worse and also can result at the end in a lack of desire. Um, uh, and also, well, in, in arousal problems. So this shows that pain pro problems and arousal problems are also uh, well strongly connected. So in most cases in women with sexual arousal or desire problems, there is not a problem of a decreased sensitivity of the sexual system. There is more, a, you may say there's not um, a, a physical problem, there's more uh, a psychological problem. So when you look at the literature and research on female sexual dysfunctions and psychological aspects or factors that are connected with female sexual problems, they, you can see that there are several factors important. First of all, a lack of previous rewarding sexual experiences. Also more negative sexual experiences such as sexual abuse experiences. Women with sexual dysfunctions often uh, show more negative opinions and attitudes towards sex. There often is also a, a fear, a fear of pain during sex, but also a fear of failure, not, um, for example, the fear of not being able to become sexually aroused. And we also see a connection with negative mood and also with more stress. So more negative mood or higher levels of, of daily stress is also connected with female sexual dysfunction. And an important factor is also the experience of the body. So it's often connected to a more, more negative body image. And also really important in women, there's a strong connection with relationship satisfaction. So when there's lower relationship satisfaction, there's often uh, more sexual problems. In this case, of course, it's not easy to disentangle what comes first. So are there first relationship problems and then sexual problems or are there sexual problems and with the result relationship problems, but they do go together and influence each other. So these are important psychological factors in female sexual dysfunction. So what I want to discuss is also some clinical implications for what can be learned from these model and this kind of research that also yeah, shows proof of these models. What can we learn from it for clinical practice? And I think that what we can learn from it is that in clinical practice, you always should think of three important factors when there are problems of sexual interest and arousal. You should think, what about the sensitivity of the sexual system? Is there a reason to think of decreased arousability? for example, as a consequence of really low testosterone levels or, or neurotransmitter uh, problems because of side effects of medication. 
So you should think of the sensitivity of the sexual system. You should also think of the meaning and the availability of what we may call adequate sexual stimuli. And you th should think of the psychological and relational context. And these three things or aspects can also give you a clue to for what kind of interventions you should look. So for example, when we talk about the sensitivity of the system, when there is really low testosterone uh, because of illness or there are side effects of medication affecting, for example, dopamine levels. In most cases of women, female patients with, that seek help for sexual problems, this is not a problem, but there are, of course, women with decreased sensitivity of the sexual system. And then you can think of interventions to change it. For example, a medication change with less sexual side effect or hormone substitution, for example, by um, uh, increasing testosterone levels. And you can also think, when you think of the sensitivity of the system, maybe of the so-called lust pill. And actually in Europe, there's no lust pill on the market for women, but there is one in the United States, phlebenturin. But we should also say that there's a lot of discussion about this pill because uh, and there's a very nice review actually uh, by uh, Jaspers and co-authors um, of, of the, the studies done on the effect of this pill. There's a lot of discussion because the clinical um, therapeutic effect is really, really small. Um, so women become a very, very little bit more sexual activity, uh, active using this pill. And also this pill has also side effects. So um, there is also a disadvantage uh, in using this pill. And also what is important that when you think of using pills to, to change sexual interest and arousal, it is still very important to think about the stimulus part in that sexual response or sexual incentive motivation model. Because when the stimulus is not very attractive for the woman, then you can take maybe another pill, but it will not work because there should be a match with a positive sexual stimulus. Otherwise, there will be no positive sexual feelings and feelings of desire and feelings of arousal. So it is in treatment very important to think about the stimulus part and first to think, is there maybe a negative meaning of sex? Is there sexual trauma in history? Is there, for example, a negative upbringing? in the area of sexuality? Uh, did the women receive a lot of negative information or messages um, in the area of sex? For example, sex is bad or is something you shouldn't do, uh, something that women shouldn't like? Or is there a long history of having pain during sex? It is important to find out whether there are attractive stimuli. What about the attractive feelings of attraction to the partner? Is a partner attractive for a woman? Is there attention for sexual stimuli uh, that can be attractive for a woman? So in treatments, the stimulus part is really important and also to think of interventions that help um, in the stimulus side. So when there is trauma, you should think first before you start a sex therapy, whether um, there is um, a problem of sexual trauma and still PTSS, for example, then the first choice should be trauma treatment. 
And after that, you can work on the stimulation of more uh, positive sexual experiences. And that you can do by offering sex therapy in which you learn people to find out with kind of what kind of sexual stimuli they like or dislike and how they can find them and how they can um, experiment with different kinds of stimulations to find out what, what they can experience as rewarding and pleasurable. And in this kind of treatment, sex therapy, which is actually a cognitive behavioral way of working, you also have attention for cognitions that may inhibit arousal and desire. And in this kind of treatment, sex therapy, we also have a lot of attention for psychoeducation about female sexuality. Uh, what do women need to make sex rewarding? Think of, for example, what do women need to experience orgasm in a sexual interaction? And we pay a lot of attention to increase the assertiveness also in women to ask, to, to learn what they need, and also to communicate that in their sexual relationship and to improve their communication with a partner. Uh, and another third factor really important to notice is the psychological and relational context. So you should be aware in female sexual dysfunction. What about stress levels? What about relationship satisfaction? What about the communication in the relationship? Because this is also strongly influencing female sexual functioning. So when there is stress, highly daily stress, you should think of interventions to reduce stress levels. And when there is low relationship satisfaction, you should think of couple therapy in which you discuss feelings, negative feelings, and promote more positive uh, interactions and experiences and improve communication in the relationship. And then in sex therapy, a really good way also in improving communication about sexuality and what you like and dislike are the so-called censored focus uh, exercises, which were actually developed by Masters and Johnson, the pioneers in sex therapy. And this is, uh, these are exercises in which the couple starts with non-genital touching of each other and when they are okay with that non-genital touching and they can share what they like and dislike they go on with genital touching and also communicating about what they like and dislike in this genital touching and learn how to communicate about what they like and dislike in the area of sexuality and in these exercises, you also uh, learn or try to train individuals to focus on their emotions in a, well, a most positive way by not what we call spectatoring, not a way of being aware of your responses and um, constantly judging whether it works or not for you or do you respond or not but you try to learn people to focus on the sensation they actually experience and to experience this in a not uh, non-judgeable way a kind of mindfulness experience mm -hmm. of the sensation of being touched and this kind of exercises are really helpful in learning people how they uh, can experience sexual pleasure. And the experience of sexual pleasure is very important uh, also to increase feelings of sexual desire and interest. So this is really important those sex therapy interventions to work on sexual arousal and sexual interests. 
Now, I also want to give you some information about the treatment of sexual pain in women. So a very, um, actually, in our department, uh, a lot of women come with the problem of experiencing pain during sexual intercourse or the inability to have vaginal penetration, what you call vaginismus. And in dyspareunia, pain during penetration or during intercourse, we work from this vicious circle explanatory model. So what we do is the first thing we do in treatment is advise women and the couple to stop the pain experience. So you give exact, um, um, well, you may say uh, a ban on pain uh, to, to break this vicious circle. And we also focus in treatment in optimal care of the full of her skin because in this vicious circle, there can be irritation of the skin. So we pay attention to optimal care of the full of her skin to improve the condition because a lot of these women with this, this perunia problem, this sexual pain problem, have painful spots um, at the skin of the entrance of the vagina. So then it's really important to take care of the condition of that sulfur skin. And in treatment, we focus on learning how to um, relax the pelvic floor muscles, how to control the pelvic floor muscles, how can you contract them and how can you relax them? Because very often there is increased pelvic floor muscle tension because of that fear of pain in sexual situations. So when we learn women how to relax their pelvic floor, and when they know how to relax the pelvic floor, and also when they have a more a better condition of the full first skin, they can start with what we call exercises to overcome their fear of pain. And we give them gradual exposure exercises, and these are actually penetration exercises during which they, well, they um, try in small steps to bring in first one of their own fingers um, or, and when they are able to bring in a finger without pain, they can continue with practicing penetration with two fingers and they can also use what we call pelotas uh, in different sizes to find out uh, when they really relax their pelvic floor uh, and they have a, a good full for skin condition, how they can bring in something with the size of the penis without pain. Uh, and this is a way to also overcome fear of pain in sexual situations, which can help eventually in being able to have sexual intercourse and penetration again, uh, when there's also uh, enough sexual excitement, and we work on that by using sex therapy intervention I described, described to you, when there is more arousal and also less fear of pain, then it can really help in solving this, this Perunia problem. For vaginismus, I think it's interesting to tell you that we have a different kind of approach. In vaginismus, you very often see that there's a strong avoidance, a really high fear of vaginal penetration, and a strong avoidance of vaginal penetration. So women with vaginismus are very so very often that fearful of pain during penetration that they tried, for example, to bring in menstrual tampons once, but they didn't succeed and don't try again. Or they tried to have intercourse, but it didn't succeed and it was very painful. And then they avoid trying. So there's a lot of avoidance behavior. 
Um, and we think that it is important to work on that strong fear and avoidance. And I will tell you why, because before we treated vaginismus um, in a similar way as dyspareunia. We paid attention to increasing sexual interest and arousal, and we worked on also, um, um, well, we gave psychoeducation about pain and fear and muscle tension, and we worked with relaxation exercises and those gradual exposure exercises, similar to the dyspareunia approach. And we worked on, well, the, the, the facilitation of sexual responses and better communication with the partner. So it was really a kind of similar treatment. But when this treatment for vaginismus was evaluated, it was uh, observed that after a treatment, um, only... Um, um, 23% of the women was at the end able to have um, sexual intercourse, to have successful vaginal penetration with the penis. And in this study of the treatment effect, it was also looked what kind of factors predicted success. And what was observed that one of the predictors of success in this treatment program was that when there was less avoidance of homework penetration exercises, when women were more active in doing those penetration exercises at home, uh, then they also had more success and were able to have sexual intercourse after treatment. So then the idea appeared, uh, and this was an idea of one of my previous colleagues uh, in, uh, at the hospital uh, in, uh, in, in Leiden in the Netherlands. The idea was that women should be more helped in doing those penetration exercises and not avoiding them. So then, it was decided to focus the therapy more on fear of penetration and on avoidance behavior and to find out whether that treatment would be more effective. So then uh, a therapist-aided exposure treatment for vaginismus was developed. And in this treatment for vaginismus, so these are women that have never been able to have um, sexual intercourse because penetration wasn't possible. Uh, and these women can receive a treatment uh, during which they come to the hospital and they are um, uh, working with the female therapists and they come together with their partner and they come for a one week treatment uh, that includes three sessions. And these sessions take two to three hours. So these are really long. Uh, uh, therapy sessions and during these sessions the woman is actually doing this penetration these stepwise penetration exercises to overcome fear of penetration at the hospital herself while she has, she is coached by the female therapist um, and during this treatment um, week um, there are three practice sessions at the hospital, but the couple also has to practice at home twice daily. So they have to practice for an hour one uh, or an hour and a half together to do this, those penetration exercises, these stepwise exercises. So the couple has to have, has to take a, a week uh, off from work uh, and focus completely on doing this treatment. And then you can see them, we have follow-up sessions after six weeks and after 12 weeks of this treatment. And during these treatment sessions at the hospital, uh, as a therapist, you are coaching the woman to bring something in the vagina. 
And you start with a lot of education and information about the anatomy of the genitals of the woman and also about the pelvic floor. And you give a lot of information how it is possible to bring something in. And then you start with the, uh, well, you may say, the, the smallest step in the, in the fear um, uh, ladder, we call it. So, for example, you, fear, you start with um, holding her own finger at the entrance of the vagina and then contract and relax the pelvic floor muscles. And then when that's possible, uh, and she did that a couple of times, then you can do a next step, for example, bringing in a small piece of her own finger. And then you can progress with things that have a larger size, such as the lotus. Um, and during this treatment, as a therapist, you are not touching the patient. The patient is doing everything herself. Actually, on this picture, you see uh, the therapist, but this is a medical doctor, uh, and she's touching the leg of the, the, the patient, which is not a real patient, <laughs> um, but um, this is only to, to show the setting. Actually, it's a student. Uh, but um, when we give this treatment as psychologists, we never touch the patient. We only talk and coach. It's a bit similar like other treatments for phobic fear, for example, fear of driving a car. Then it's not unusual now to go with your patient into the car and drive. Uh, and this is the same. And we treat it like a strong fear, uh, a phobic fear for vaginal penetration. Uh, and what you can actually see um, is that when you focus on reducing this avoidance behavior, and by coaching, you increase successful penetration ex experiences, and you disconfirm catastrophic beliefs like that it's that it's not fitting or the entrance of the vagina is too small uh, or that it will be very painful. You just confirm these beliefs by doing these stepwise uh, exercises. You can see that this treatment is really, really successful because when you compare it to the effects of a waiting list condition with this uh, therapist aided exposure treatment, you can see success in a waiting list condition was 11% and success is being able to have sexual intercourse. And at follow-up after 12 weeks after this exposure treatment, almost 90% of the women were able to have vaginal penetration with penis of their partner. So this is really, really a successful way of treating uh, vaginismus. So we, we changed the treatment of vaginismus into this, um, well, a therapist aided exposure uh, treatment way of working. So, well, I think I am at the end of the, of the, the time I have, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to, uh, I gave you a lot of information. I'm really happy to answer all your questions. And, uh, I also thought, well, I give you some suggestions for further reading because these are really interesting and very informative books, I think, on sexuality. Um, and um, I thank you for your attention.